<clears throat> Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're going to wait a few moments to allow everyone time to log in and join us. Welcome, welcome. Welcome everyone. We're just waiting uh, to allow everyone time to log on and join us. <laughs> okay, we are going to get started. Hello everyone and welcome to Hawk Mountain Sanctuaries 2021 Benefit for the Birds Spring Campaign and Online Auction Presentation on Vultures, Hawk Mountain's long-term research, the importance to our ecosystems, and our latest findings. My name is Jamie Dawson. I'm the Director of Education at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, and thank you all so much for joining us this evening. As you may know, Hawk Mountain is the world's very first refuge for birds of prey. And we continue to work hard to be leaders in raptor conservation, science, and education locally and globally around the world. Hawk Mountain is a private nonprofit and membership is the lifeblood of our organization. To all of our members out there, we want to send you the biggest thank you for your continued support. It means so much to us. Thank you. Thank you. And for anyone who's joining us this evening and is not a member, we, we love you too, so thank you for joining us and we hope that you consider becoming a member in the future. Hawk Mountain hopes that everyone remains safe and healthy during these times of COVID challenges and we are beyond excited to be able to offer our local and global community a variety of free virtual programming. But as always, Hawk Mountain greatly appreciate, appreciates and absolutely depends on donations. Just so everyone is aware, today's program is being recorded. The video will then be accessible on Hawk Mountain's YouTube channel as a continued resource. We also have a link on our website directly connecting you to our YouTube channel. At any point during today's program, viewers may submit their questions through the Q&A feature on the Zoom platform and we've designated time at the end of the program to take some questions from the audience. And we are thrilled that Dr. Lori Goodrich David Barber and Bracken Brown are joining us today as we celebrate Hawk Mountains 2021 Benefit for the Birds Spring Campaign and Online Auction to support the sanctuary and give you some updates of the latest findings of our long-term vulture research. Before we get started, we'd like to take a moment to thank all of our generous sponsors who have contributed to our online auction and spring campaign. We'd like to extend special gratitude to the following sponsorships. Allegra, Lehigh Valley. PPNL Services Corporation. Christina Clayton and Stanley Colbert. Jeff and Samina Weil. Deborah Edge and Neil Mann. Mintern Wright. Holly Merker. And everyone else who gave a donation to support the 2021 Spring Campaign and Online Auction. We've also included in the chat the link to the web pages that you can go to if you would like to donate to the spring uh, campaign or to make a cash gift. We'd like to remind everyone that this is a fundraising event and it is our goal to raise $30,000 for raptor conservation. I can't think of a better cause. Cash donations and online bid bidding will help us to reach that goal. People are encouraged to bid high and to bid often. Bidding will end tonight, May 13th at 10 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So the countdown is on. And to ensure that you get that special item or experience that has caught your eye, be sure to go online on our, on our auction through Greater Giving to make your final bids tonight before 10 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. At the end of the program, I will share how to sign up to bid if you have not done so already. And also keep in mind that if there aren't any auction items of personal interest, people can donate and contribute in other ways, such as supporting our totally awesome and important vulture research. $100 will support the monitoring of a black or turkey vulture nest site and wing tagging young to study dispersal movements. 
$500 will help support the purchase of a telemetry unit for a black vulture for the Northeast and its data download charges. $1,000 will provide funds towards the purchase of a telemetry unit and travel costs to Northeastern nest site to tag a bird or support our feathered educators that live at Hawk Mountain with a gift. Gift of any size will help provide care for our birds, their food, medicine, and veterinary services. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce to you all our featured speaker for this evening, Dr. Lori Goodrich. <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. It is great to be with everybody for the 2021 Benefit for the Birds. I'm very, very excited to uh, be here tonight with my conservation science colleagues. And uh, David Barber, senior research biologist and Bracken Brown biologist naturalists are gonna be the, the key speakers tonight. But uh, I'd like to start out with a little bit of background on our vulture research, which has been going on for over 15 years here. And you know, one of the key questions that a lot of people ask is why are we studying vultures? And the Hawk Mountain, Hawk Mountain's founder, Rosalie Edge, was very famous for saying the time to save a species is while it is still common. And this is especially true for vultures because if you were driving around Asia over 20 years ago, you would see vultures were very, very common individuals on the landscape. But then about 15 years ago, vulture numbers worldwide, particularly in Asia and Africa, took a nosedive. And currently, if you look at the status of vultures around the world, 65% of vultures in Asia and Africa are listed as endangered or critically endangered. Where, and new world vultures, which are vultures that uh, inhabit the Americas, 20% of those are listed as endangered or critically endangered. That percentage is much higher than we see for any other raptor group, including eagles, falcons, and others. So uh, it's really important that we study these vultures before they get that, that low in numbers. In fact, there have been some species in, in Asia that have declined by over 95%. So it's even difficult to even see them on the landscape at all. Now, why has this decline occurred? Well, about 15 years ago, there was a drug that was used in cattle called diclofenac that was used very commonly and widespread throughout uh, the continents. And unfortunately, it was highly poisonous to vultures so that when vultures uh, fed on cattle that happened to die on the ranches, uh, they were getting killed by, by huge numbers. But in addition to that, vultures today are the target of, of, of poisoning events uh, in Africa, uh, poachers that are trying to uh, avoid getting arrested by wildlife officials will poison vultures at their kills. Uh, vulture parts in some parts of the world are very va are valued for traditional medicine, so vultures are being killed for that reason. And there's all kinds of reasons that, that vultures are being targeted. So it's important for us to study them for that reason. Now, Hawk Mountain, of course, has, has been a leader in long-term studies of raptors. And it was our data on bald eagles in the 1950s and 1960s that was used by Rachel Carson to signal how DDT was impacting both wildlife and people. So these long-term data that we're able to collect at Hawk Mountain uh, are very unique. And Hawk Mountain is one of the best places for this kind of long-term research. And so for all of these reasons, back in the early 2000s, Dr. Keith Bildstein, our former director of conservation science, initiated a research study on new world vultures because he saw what was happening in Asia and Africa and also in Europe. And he set up the project for the beginning as a collaborative project. So we were collaborating with scientists all over the Americas, but also within Hawk Mountain. So David Barber, who's still with us today, um, was one of the early collaborators on the vulture research. Dr. J.F. Terrian, who's also uh, a key part of our vulture research now, was also collaborating. And then uh, more recently, we've, we've hired D Bracken Brown, who's been in a very important uh, addition to our vulture team. So today, if you look at what's going on with vultures around the Americas, there's lots of people starting to study turkey vultures, and which is very good. Uh, but Hawk Mountain is really the leader in this vulture research. We have been monitoring uh, vultures and studying them from Argentina all the way uh, north through Canada for many years, again, collaborating with other people. 
And we're using three methods to study the vultures. And we're gonna talk about a little bit of the, of the findings from those research projects tonight. One of the methods is trying to understand their populations and, the, and whether the populations have changed or not. And we use a very simple method and that's called road surveys where we drive routes, um, where our colleagues drive routes around the continents and try to uh, and count the number of vultures. And we're right in a very exciting time for the road survey data because uh, we're in the process of finishing up the second round of surveys. So we're gonna know a lot more about vultures very soon. The second method is using wing tags, which, um, which I'm sure Dave is going to talk about, where we can just mark birds. It's a very low cost. And then we rely, rely on people like yourselves to report them back to us. And we can look at movements and how far they're moving away from where they were tagged. And the third method is satellite telemetry, which gives us highly detailed data. And David's going to be talking a little bit about that on movement ecology and hopefully survival and habitat use as well. And just recently, we're adding a fourth method to our toolkit, and that is looking at nesting vultures in and around Hawk Mountain. So we're gonna learn a little bit about that tonight as well. So it's very exciting research. And uh, you know, there's probably lots of questions that you have about vultures, even if we don't talk about it tonight, you can bring it up in the question and answer. Who better to answer them but our vulture experts, David and Bracken. Um, so I'd like to just turn it over to my uh, esteemed colleagues and, uh, let me first introduce them. David Barber, senior research biologist at Hawk Mountain, has his master's degree in zoology and has been an integral part of the Hawk Mountain science team for over 22 years. He currently oversees uh, many of our long-term monitoring projects, in particular, the Hawk Migration Count. So a very big project. And he's also our key person in GIS, in computer mapping. So any map that you see coming out of Hawk Mountain probably has his initials on it somewhere. And he now is overseeing our vulture movement and migration studies. So David, do you want to say hello? Thank you for the intro, Lori, and welcome everybody. Glad you could tune into our gala. And then also with us today is Bracken Brown. Bracken is a is the biologist naturalist who was hired full-time in 2019, but we feel like he's an old friend because he's been volunteering with Hawk Mountain since he was a, a little boy, I think, five years old maybe. Um, helping out with kestrel research, helping out with uh, vulture research, and also being a Hawk Mountain volunteer counter. So uh, highly experienced. He worked with the state of Delaware and the state of Virginia on uh, raptor research over the years and also has worked at the Raptor View Institute in Montana uh, before he came to Hawk Mountain. So Bracken has been a very important uh, partner with David in studying um, black vultures and, and local roosts and uh, nest monitoring. And he's also taking on uh, public outreach and trying to uh, educate landowners about vultures. So we're very happy to have Bracken on the team. And I'm gonna turn it over to Bracken, let him say hello and kick off our program for tonight. Thank you so much for the intro, Lori, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for inviting us into your homes uh, for the evening to talk about a subject that's near and dear to all of us here at Hawk Mountain. And hopefully by the end of the evening, uh, the same can be said for you. You'll uh, grow in your appreciation of vultures somewhat. So uh, when we talk about vultures in the news, uh, often, as Lori said, it's focused on the old world with dramatic declines in a lot of the species, uh, primarily due to poisoning or uh, picking up toxins in the environment. As scavengers, these birds are phenomenal resources in our ecosystem as far as recycling. And we're really fortunate here in Hawk Mountain that our two local species of vulture, the turkey vulture and black vulture seen here on the left, are uh, the most populous species of vultures in the world. For turkey vultures, there's an estimate of 18 million globally. Uh, and this is their range map on the right. So you can see purple is where the birds can be found year round. Red is where they're found in the summer only. Uh, and blue is winter expansion. Black vultures uh, pretty much follow the non-breeding range map for turkey vultures, so I just uh, use the same map for both. Uh, they have an estimated population of 20 million. Um, for both of those species, for black vultures, there's uh, 1.5 million found in North America. And turkey vultures, there's an estimate of 5 million birds. Uh, most of those are 
migratory birds that funnel out of our western uh, states and move down into northern South America for the winter, whereas black vultures uh, tend to be uh, considered mostly non-migratory local bodies that hang out at their roosts, but there are some movements. So vultures really uh, are undersold when it comes to research as far as movement and dispersal, because early on they found that they were um, unable to put bands on their legs, so they sort of for went the banding craze that went into tracking and gathering movement data for a lot of our bird species here in North America because uh, they undergo urohydrosis. So they defecate on the legs as a evaporative cooling technique, but that makes putting a band there uh, unlikely. So they sort of went overlooked for a species that is so common in your backyard. You can go out your door any summer afternoon and you're likely to see vultures uh, thermaling in the backyard there. So uh, for a common species, they went overlooked and for a species that really looks at what we're doing and relies on us as far as a meal ticket, uh, it is vital that we understand what they're doing within the environment so we can manage uh, to ensure that they're still providing their terms and services uh, for us. And it's an estimate of over 700 million, I believe was the last estimate for turkey vultures cleaning up uh, roadkill alone. So how do you understand a population? Uh, one of our techniques is vulture road surveys. And this just gives you a general pulse of what's going on within a region. Uh, so you, initiate driving the survey after vultures have taken off from the roost uh, for, for the day. So mid-morning, you'll drive through the good lift period of the day, uh, looking for vultures, counting how far off of the road transect they are on a set route. You do a couple routes for a region, and then at the end of that, you can uh, come up with sort of a bird per kilometer estimate for the population in the region. Um, this alone isn't a great technique for understanding what's going on with the vultures, but the uh, vitality of this database that we're building is each time we repeat these surveys after a set period of time, we're looking at 10 year gaps in between these, uh, you can begin to build a movement population wide dispersal uh, map. Uh, so you're looking at where birds are moving to within the non-breeding and the breeding seasons and what areas or shifts within the population are occurring. So back in 2005, we initiated our road surveys through the use of collaborators and us going out and visiting these sites. Uh, so uh, in from 2005 to about 2010, the first rounds were driven and we collected data and we're in the process of repeating our second round of surveys. So that's only gonna be two data points uh, for each of these sites. Everything in green, we've completed a second round and can begin to look at what's happened to the vulture population in those regions between the survey periods. And anything in red is yet to be done. The last year, given the uh, hiccups, uh, of course, slowed our uh, survey route, but we're hoping through pairing up with collaborators uh, that will get this wrapped up in the next couple of years here. And road surveys are a phenomenal collaboration tool. Vultures are relatively easy to ID, uh, so we can communicate with people on the ground um, and get them to drive the routes for us, collect data so that we can then uh, hopefully increase the rate of our surveys moving forward and get more informed uh, management or distribution idea of the population. Um, we're also looking at combining uh, Christmas bird counts and breeding bird census data uh, to add to our vulture population portfolio. So as Lori said, we're going to look at three locations. Uh, this is Panama. So you can see the survey routes are fairly dispersed throughout the region. We use roads because that is your effective tool. Um, and vultures often uh, can be found using the same roads looking for roadkill. So what can we say about Pan Panama? Uh, we've done our second round. 
So in 2005, down near the equator, this is the stronghold of the black vultures, which is considered an equatorial concentration species. Uh, so you can see that per 100 kilometers, we have over 400 black vultures in the summer, non-breeding period, and then in the winter, the first time around, that was over 600 black vultures per a set distance. So high density of vultures. Uh, for turkey vultures, there's much less. Uh, it was about 56 uh, for the summer period. And then as uh, winter migrants came into the region, that population trended up. So uh, when we repeated the surveys, we were expecting to see really strong black vulture numbers and hoping to see a similar trend. So you can see that for turkey vultures, the trend is very similar, those wintering birds coming into the region. Um, and while we still had high concentrations of black vultures, it was actually in reverse to what we first saw. So summer, we were at over 500 per 100 kilometers. Whereas in the winter, uh, they were at 269 black vultures per 100 kilometers. So these sorts of general trends can give you uh, pause or a reason to look a little closer at the data. So we might begin paying a little more attention to Panama if we see similar trends uh, going forward. South Carolina, so this is moving north up into the Americas. Uh, Initially, we had low numbers of black vultures, uh, less than 20, uh, and they were stable for both the winter and summer months. There's not a whole lot of difference in population there, uh, which is expected for a non-migratory bird hanging out in the region year round. Whereas turkey vultures coming down the East Coast, we know they're partially migratory. So South Carolina is obviously a wintering area for turkey vultures as we see this dramatic jump in the population. And this is uh, replicated in our second round of surveys, but notice that there's a dram fairly dramatic increase in population for both species, uh, but we still have this wintering uh, population of turkey vultures coming in, whereas black vultures are somewhat stable throughout the year. Really exciting, jumping north to our backyard here, our Pennsylvania-New York route. If we look at it, it's a little meager on the vulture data. Uh, let me move the faces here. So as you can see, whereas Panama is into the hundreds for the population, the first route of surveys, we only had turkey vultures during the summer. No black vultures were observed and no vultures of either species were seen for that winter. So all the birds in the area migrated out. When we repeated the surveys, uh, we saw a similar thing, but a dramatic increase in the number of turkey vultures summering in New York, and then uh, a much reduced population for that wintering period. And interestingly enough, we now have black vultures showing up on both these routes. So this is a nice, uh, accoutrement to what we know from uh, migration counts because black vultures have been expanding north, uh, on, especially on the east coast. So we know they're up into Vermont, almost to Canada. So we we're expecting to see some and the surveys caught it. Interestingly enough, uh, while it's a few individuals, we only had nine black vultures on the winter survey route, all of them in Ithaca, New York. Uh, spending the winter downtown where it was nice and warm. Uh, so we have this weird, somewhat weird, uh, less vulture, black vultures in the summer, but while they're dispersed and nesting in the region, it's not necessarily uh, surprising that we didn't see them. So those are three spots throughout the range. Uh, and it's really exciting that we're completing these second rounds. So our database is only gonna get stronger and we're looking to add collaborators. A lot of these routes are done by our trainees uh, and it's a fantastic way to check in with our collaborators. Another method is looking at the individuals and tracking them and to do that, David is gonna talk to you a little bit about our transmitter tracking data.
You're on mute, David. David, we're still not able to hear you. Um, I don't know if you're on mute or if there is an audio issue. Oh, there we go. For some reason, it wasn't. Uh, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Great. Okay. Okay, so starting over, um, when we first started this project back in 2003, almost 20 years ago, there was very little known about the migratory movements of turkey vultures. So for example, this flock of turkey vultures flying over the Kekalee Hawkwatch in Costa Rica, the question is, where do these birds come from and where are these birds going to? Um, and understanding the movements of animals is really critical uh, for understanding their ecology and predicting their survival in the face of rapid changes of climate or land use or habitat. And for migratory birds in particular, it's really important to understand where the birds are breeding and where the birds are wintering. Um, so kind of connecting those two areas, a, a term we call migratory connectivity. Um, and it's really important specifically for effective conservation um, of species that could potentially be declining. So where do we want to put our conservation efforts? Is it in those breeding areas? Is it in the wintering areas? Or is it somewhere in between on that migration? So in order to look at the movement ecology of vultures, we started using satellite telemetry. So this is one of our turkey vultures with a satellite telemetry unit on its back. It weighs about 30 grams, the unit that is, um, and it will give you a location, a GPS location, about every hour. So this bird is, um, or it's attached using Teflon ribbon um, in a backpack style, so it doesn't affect their flight or their behavior at all. So in, under, in order to understand kind of the variability in movements throughout the species range, or the turkey vultures range, we really want to take a range-wide approach. So we relied on collaborators kind of throughout the turkey vultures range to help us attach satellite tags to these birds. So to date, we've tagged 83 birds with satellite units, 18 in Pennsylvania, one in Minnesota, 12 in Saskatchewan, four in Washington, four in California, 28 in Arizona, and 15 in Argentina. So what we've found is that there is a tremendous amount of variability in the distances that these vultures move, as well as where they're overwintering, where they're migrating to during the winter. So if we look at this map in front of us, each individual line is the movements of a particular vulture. And this is just a sample of the vultures that we tag in each population. If we look at Pennsylvania, of those 18 birds that we tagged, only about half of the birds migrated. The rest stayed in Pennsylvania. And those that did migrate, most of them migrated into Georgia and Florida for the winter. Now, if we go over to Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan birds made huge distance movements, um, most of them into Venezuela in the wintertime with a couple stopping over in Costa Rica and one in Colombia. And if we look at the birds in the west coast, we can see that most of those birds that moved north uh, made similar distance movements and migrated into western Mexico and one into Guatemala. So for each of these populations, we're looking at a fairly small area where we tag birds migrating to a fairly small area of where they were overwintering. So fairly strong migratory connectivity. Now, when we look at the birds that we tagged in Arizona, we see a slightly different picture. A lot of these birds, or there's a lot of variation in how far they migrated in the winter time or uh, in the fall to their wintering grounds. Um, they migrated anywhere from uh, 1,000 kilometers to almost 5,000 kilometers. 
wintering in northern Mexico all the way down into Colombia in, in northern South America. So for this population, um, not very strong migratory connectivity. There's a fairly large overwintering area where these birds are. Now, if we look at Argentina, we see sort of a similar pattern that we do to in, in the population in Arizona. A lot of variability in where these birds are moving and how far they're moving. Um, these birds are, are breeding in central Argentina and moving north um, to their wintering grounds. And so most of the birds, or I should say about two thirds of the birds were migrating north uh, through Bolivia into southwestern Brazil. But we also had quite a few birds that um, deviated from that major migratory pathway, um, overwintering in uh, central Brazil or northern Peru, Chile, or northern Uruguay. So with these two populations, not very strong migratory connectivity. And you can tell from these maps that there is a huge range in how far these birds are moving. Um, obviously, Canada, those birds were moving the greatest distance over 7,200 kilometers, which is about 4,500 miles. And Pennsylvania birds were traveling the least distance or the shortest distance, um, just under 1,300 kilometers on average, with the other populations uh, somewhere in between. Now, if we look at the duration or the amount of time that these birds spend on their fall migration, um, it follows a similar pattern to the distances uh, that they're, they're, uh, they're migrating. So the Canada birds are actually spending the longest time on migration, um, on average 52 days during that fall migration. So if you think about it um, and you combine spring and fall migration, that's about a third of the year that the birds are spending on migration. And migration is probably the most stressful, um, energetically uh, expensive movements that these birds are making. So they're spending a third of the time making these long distance moves, which is, which is remarkable. The big outlier in these populations and how long they're on migration is the Pennsylvania birds. So even though they're only migrating about 1300 kilometers, they're spending 47 days on average making that short distance migration. And the reason why is because they're not moving very far. So this is the distance that these birds are traveling per day. Um, Pennsylvania birds on average are only traveling about 61 kilometers a day. We know that these birds are stopping over much more often than, um, than uh, the other birds in other populations. So that's one reason why the duration is much larger. Um, we see that Canada, actually those birds are traveling the greatest distances per day, um, are, are about 246 kilometers. So these birds are also moving slightly faster, um, more kilometers per hour. And they're also spending more time during the day actually migrating than other populations. So the fact that they're moving you know, almost 250 kilometers a day is pretty remarkable considering that these birds aren't using powered flight. So they're obligate soaring migrants, which means that they're relying on either thermals or slope soaring to migrate. So moving this long distance in a day is fairly remarkable. In fact, we've actually recorded some turkey vultures in the Saskatchewan population moving at uh, 100 kilometers an hour, which is roughly 60 miles an hour. And again, they're using uh, 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 soaring flight and then gliding in between thermals. So the fact that they're moving um, that fast uh, is, is, is pretty remarkable. But the one pattern that we do see, even though there's lots of variation among populations in speed, duration, one thing that we do find is that in every population, the rate that they're moving is much faster in the spring than it is in the autumn. One reason may be that um, the early bird gets the best territory. Um, and obviously these birds don't want to really force their migration to end up on the breeding grounds in, in, uh, in compromised condition, but it's possible that their, their 
condition in the wintering grounds is such that it allows them to move faster, travel longer distances per day, um, spend more time of the day in migration in the spring than they do in the fall. But one of the couple, a couple of the really cool questions that we can ask with satellite telemetry data that we haven't been able to ask before is, do families migrate together? And I can say for one family in, of turkey vultures in Saskatchewan, the answer is no. So the light colored dots are juveniles and the brighter colored dots are adults. And even though both juveniles left Saskatchewan on the same day, and they both overwintered in Costa Rica. They took different paths. They traveled at different rates and arrived in Costa Rica at different times. So they didn't travel together. And the female left seven days before the male did, um, traveled in a different route and overwintered in Colombia, whereas the male overwintered in Argentina. So none of these birds actually migrated together. One of the other questions we can ask is, does an individual bird always take the same migration path? And for Leo, another bird from Saskatchewan, the answer is no. Again, so this is 10 years worth of data. Um, each colored dot, different colored dot is a different year. And as you can see, as it's migrating south through the Midwest, it varies a lot from year to year, which path is taking, probably due to local environmental variables at and that particular year. But once it hits Northern Mexico, the path is pretty similar all the way until you get to the Andes Mountains in Colombia. So if you look at that inset map, we can see that um, when the bird hits the Andes, each year it's taking a different route. Again, probably due to local environmental variables, but it takes different routes, but it ends up in the same area. So I could actually zoom in on Google Earth to a small woodlot in Venezuela, and eight out of the 10 years, Leo spent time roosting in that very small woodlot. So there's really high site fidelity among most these populations of turkey vultures. They breed in a particular site year after year, and they overwinter in a particular site year after year. Now we've also had graduate students and former trainees using our satellite telemetry data to answer questions um, for their PhD. Jamie Mandel was our first graduate student on this project um, and he did his PhD at Cornell looking at how environmental variables affect the modes of migration among these different populations. So do some populations use more soaring, some others use slope soaring, um, and whether that is related to thermal kinetic energy or tailwinds and things of that nature. Julie Mallon was interested in studying stopover ecology of turkey vultures. So she looked at movements of vultures during stopovers to try and estimate how much energy vultures are using during their migration among these different populations. And finally, Adrian Nevada is currently working on his PhD and he's interested in looking at the variability of travel rate and home range size among populations as well as between the sexes in these populations. So we've answered a lot of questions over the years, but there's still a lot of questions yet to be asked and answered. Um, some of which could be simple as, are the movements of these birds different during the breeding season versus the non-breeding season? Or what kind of habitats do they use in breeding and non-breeding and do those vary among the different populations. Now, turkey vultures are not the only successful abundant vulture in the new world. Black vultures, as Bracken mentioned, um, the estimated population is about 20 million. The core of their distribution is more southerly than turkey vultures are. And as Bracken showed with, uh, uh, with our uh, road survey data, um, they're more abundant in the south than they are in northern in northern U.S., um, but they're slowly expanding their range northward in the U.S. So based on this map and based on the literature that's out there, um, turkey vultures do not migrate. But 
I can tell you from sitting on North Lookout for hundreds of hours counting migrating raptors that they do migrate. Um, and it's really, they believe that's the northern birds that are um, leaving the winter, leaving the breeding grounds and moving south. So we're really excited to figure out where the birds that we're seeing at Hawk Mountain, where they're coming from from and where they're going to. So Bracken and I are headed up to New England this summer. Uh, we're hoping to trap two black vultures and attach uh, GPS, GSM satellite units to them, uh, units that can collect a lot more data than the units that we've used in the, in the past. And so hopefully getting, uh, learning not only where these birds are coming from and going to, but also looking at their movement ecology and is the movement behavior different in these northern birds than they are in the southern birds. And it's something in their movement behavior that allows them to expand their range northward. So with that, I am going to turn it back over to Bracken and he's gonna tell you a little bit about some of the cool information that we can get from these new GSM units. Thank you, David. And yes, as uh, David mentioned, the technology is changing all the time. So with advances, we're getting a uh, finer scale or more detailed data uh, with these GSM units. Essentially, they're using the cell network and the vulture is texting in a specific location um, every couple minutes. It all depends on the charge of the battery. So as the birds warm up for the day, spread their wings and face their backs to the sun, that ch charges the solar panel. Uh, so some of these units are giving us data points every couple minutes. And another cool aspect is a lot of them are actually taking altitude as well during this period. So we can now use our transmitter data to literally fly with the vultures. So these are two black vultures, Earl and Gifford, uh, that were transmitted in the Kempton Valley back in 2015. We're gonna spend a day with them. Earl is in red, Gifford is in blue, and so uh, it's not going to be a completely smooth flight that, like what you can see with some glider uh, data. Um, this platform is used by a lot of uh, fixed wing gliders uh, to map their flights. Um, and I came across this, uh, someone in, uh, from New Jersey was putting their Eagle transmitter data into this flight simulator format. Um, and I knew exactly what I wanted to use this data for. So here we have two vultures. Uh, as they move around, we're gonna be able to track them. So here they are coming together um, in the Kempton Valley. Gifford bails off fairly quick. And that is actually one of the uh, trap sites uh, I was baiting back in 2015 about when these uh, transmitters got deployed. Uh, so we're going to move with Earl. And the cool thing about this altitude aspect, it's a somewhat choppy flight, but every time the bird goes down to the ground or perches in a tree, that interferes with it, the satellite's ability to read it. Um, so you get these uh, clusters of points, and then Earl did not fly through the landscape there. But that does mean that was a direct low altitude flight right back to the main communal roost here in the valley. So Earl's gonna hang out at the roost here in a mature stand of pine trees uh, for the rest of the day. And why don't we go see what Gifford's up to? So we're gonna switch our view here and fly around the valley. So Gifford is a fully charged, so we're getting relatively frequent data points. He's coming up into Hawk Mountain. I'm gonna actually slow this down so we can not uh, lose him in the tailspin. Uh, so here he is uh, out uh, by Hemlock Heights or uh, beyond Owl's Head on a favored patch of bare rocks. Uh, and we actually believe Gifford did nest here at this point in the year. It's uh, mid-August, so he's not nesting, but Gifford still likes to spend a lot of time up here. So here he is hanging out with a great view of the Kempton Valley on the rocks. And then he's working his way over 
to the pinnacle slope. Uh, so we can actually fly with these birds and see how they're using the landscape and what sort of lift they're getting as they move along. So here he is coming back, flies over the roost and then dips right into this valley and notice um, Earl had been there earlier in the day. This is a carcass dump site of a dairy farm. So very popular. Black vultures have no sense of smell, unlike the turkey vultures. So it's been documented that they like to uh, follow turkey vultures to find carcasses. But that doesn't mean that's their only means. Uh, they'll use their visual acuity to uh, find carcasses for themselves. But somewhere that people are dumping carcasses is something that black vultures love. And they're going to visit these sites fairly frequently um, so they can establish when something's there, benefit from eating off of it. And that's gonna cut down their need to spend the day foraging uh, throughout the valley. So as we fly through the next day with Gifford, we're gonna find out where most of the carcass spots in the valley are uh, because they're going to visit most of them. I'm going to speed this up. So here we are, uh, almost eight o'clock. That sundown, Gifford goes straight to the communal roost, flies right in. Um, and you can see this is really ideal location for black vultures. Uh, it's a mature stand of pine trees uh, that were planted sort of as a windbreak, a very popular technique uh, in developments here. And there's a pond and stream system right here. Vultures love to bathe while they're socializing and hanging out around the roost. And particularly lovely for a vulture is there's a southern slope that catches the morning sun uh, and it's actually a graveyard. So there's excellent vulture roosts um, it's somewhat alarming to the parishioners when 400 vultures showed up the first year uh, and were hanging out in the graveyard. I uh, got a couple calls about, are the graves leaking? Um, but no, this is another sign that vultures, like humans, have very specific uh, preferences when it comes to where they're going to spend their time. So during the night, it's not that exciting. They're hanging out around the roost. I'm gonna speed things up a bit until uh, we get to the next morning because what I wanna show you is remember Gifford was at that carcass site. Oops, slow way back down. So at 6.30 in the morning, Gifford leaves the communal roost and flies straight back to the uh, carcass dump area that he spent the last evening. So to me, this is indicating that there is something, uh, a carcass of some sort in there that they're benefiting from. Typically, vultures are very efficient. They're not gonna fly if they have to put a lot of energy into maintaining lift. So typically you'll have a communal roost hang out for a couple of hours until about 10.30, unless there's a wind. Uh, in the morning when thermals develop and then they fall into the thermal, get carried aloft and very efficient. They're not expending a lot of energy as they check out the neighborhood. Whereas if they know there's a carcass and especially black vultures, they're a communal feeder and they're very competitive compared to a turkey vulture. Um, so where turkey vultures establish the pecking order and uh, spend time or take turns feeding. Black vultures are a little more of a scrum feeder. Uh, so getting in there early, if you know there's a local carcass is uh, definitely a game changer. I'm gonna give you a leg up. So really interesting to see that these birds are um, taking advantage of this. And when they begin to move, notice both birds leave their roost sites at the same time. Earl was going back over the ridge there. Um, but to me, this is phenomenal. And the whole reason to have both uh, transmitters uh, in the view shed at the same time. Without being near each other, it's not like they visually saw the roost getting up and joined the flock. Um, but weather conditions got right for lift and all the vultures are taking off. You can see this yourself um, if you're lucky enough to be out as the vult vulture roost departs. 
Now Gifford is, uh, has presumably been eating for the last couple of hours and what he does for the day is uh, explore outside the Kempton Valley. So sorry for this pinning around. He is getting lift um, over the Eckville region up into the game lands along the top of the ridge. Notice he's climbing in altitude and then makes these forays out over the valley. So as we fly with these birds, um, we get an insight into their daily lives. And I want to get uh, on this day particularly, Gifford uh, went out over the Hamburg area. So he's about to gain a lot of altitude rel relatively quickly, crosses over the ridge, and then goes out into the landscape uh, south of where he's typically hanging out. And they then proceeds to do a bunch of these large loops. He saw something interesting, so he drops in to check it out. And again, we get this nice little scatter of uh, data points here. As the resolution fixes up. And then he begins making some movements. We can see Earl back in the Kempton Valley as our place marker here for where Gifford started out. And then I'm going to, okay. So Gifford begins gaining altitude. And he has to make that jump over the ridge. Uh, the way he does it is eventually he'll make his way um, either to the 143 corridor or he comes up over uh, the game lands. But gaining some serious altitude here, you can see him going up in that thermal and then moving back towards the ridge, continuing to benefit some lift before coming in over uh, the ridge of the pinnacle, right back to his location. So um, rather than spend more time, I'm going to jump to the end. Uh, these videos, uh, we're going to begin uh, making them publicly available as information clips, so something to look forward to. As Gifford and Earl join forces at the Hillside Acres Pig Farm Carcass Dump, you can begin to see as we back off here how they're using the landscape. So typically, this is what you look at uh, when we map our transmitter data. You have this sort of two-dimensional concentration of points where they like to be. Um, but this adds an, another level. So um, I have to give a shout out to Hillside Acres. It's a family pig farm over here. Back out a little bit. Um, and they've been uh, providing vulture bait and they're directly responsible for most of the transmitters we've deployed. So huge thanks to them. And it's awesome that we had two transmitters right up the hill. I know exactly what the woods smell and look like in that location. Um, so that's uh, some of the cool aspects of what we can do with our transmitters. And now black vultures have been coming under scrutiny. And interestingly enough, a lot of it is in these regions where the birds are recolonizing. So coming up the Mississippi corridor, uh, we call it range expansion. There's historic records of birds being there back in the time of James Audubon. Uh, for example, there's some written accounts. Uh, so I don't think it's necessarily recolonizing or range ex or uh, range expansion, but more of a recolonizing case. But on the East Coast, we're seeing rapid expansion, and we're getting a lot of headlines of people that uh, unfortunately have the underappreciated value of the black vultures here. So we're getting black vultures terrorizing Pennsylvania towns. That was in 2020. Um, black vultures bedevil, befoul. Uh, when they get into agriculture, uh, they can definitely impact livestock. So people are making moves to how to call these roosts. And unfortunately, it comes from a place of 
not necessarily understanding the birds. So Hawk Mountain is moving to put out some information pamphlets uh, coming soon. Uh, this is in the final stages of editing is backyard black vultures. And this is just focusing on uh, information about the species that hopefully will draw attention to the fact that the reason they're in your backyard is typically because there's an attractant. These are highly intelligent, there we go, uh, animals that have charismatic uh, interactions. And if you watch them, you see that intelligence come through in their social interactions. Um, but when they learn a bad habit, they will then apply that to humans elsewhere. So uh, agriculture, the farmer goes out to mow a hayfield, that's a dinner bell for most of our uh, turkey and black vultures. They know a large area of grass is going to get cut. Uh, snakes, rodents are going to get caught up in that. They go and watch and are expecting to be fed in those situations. It's not as amusing when putting cat food out on the porch results in 15 volt black vultures hanging out on your porch waiting to be fed with the cat. So uh, there's a lot of things that we do that benefit or provide food for these species and they're never going to say no turn down a free meal. Uh, so we're training vultures to be problematic in some of these cases. Again, where we place our homes, the types of plantings we put around our location can all be attractants to these large uh, vulture roofs. So uh, we're beginning our campaign to get to know the new neighbors uh, in your area. And oftentimes people just don't spend a lot of time. I've had countless people say the birds of death are here and they're watching me. Do they know something I don't know? This is not the case. Typically they're watching you to see if you're going to do something interesting or feed them. So never uh, have fear, uh, but get to know the vultures and typically you can remove the attractant and live happily alongside them. Um, so as mentioned, uh, another new and exciting aspect is looking at nesting ecology of black vultures. Starting last year, we put a uh, camera out in one of the nests. And as an underappreciated, un overlooked species, there really isn't a whole lot of information about what goes on uh, in the nest or where the birds are moving to. So with range expansion, we're particularly interested in getting transmitters and uh, tagial tags out on nestling vultures because we know the point of origin for those birds. So as we track it throughout its life, we know how it's dispersing into the environment and that can uh, make more uh, powerful modeling tool for range expansion in the species. So if you have are lucky enough to be hosting nestling black vultures or turkey vultures, please reach out to David or I, and we would love to come out and tag your chicks. We're also uh, taking measurements this year and looking to track growth and development of the young in the nest, look at provisioning from the parents, uh, what sort of things are they feeding, uh, taking some blood samples to look at toxins as a the primary recycler in the ecosystem. Vultures are a great bioindicator for what contaminants are out there. So uh, they can be a repository for a lot of things uh, from their meals. So here's a nest uh, we looked at last year. This is in a horse stall. And what's really striking is how fastidious. A lot of people say vultures are dirty and the nests definitely have an odor. Uh, don't get me wrong on that one. But the adults spend hours on these videos just carefully cleaning off the chicks, preening, interacting. Uh, so it's really cool uh, the type of data we're getting. Uh, this nest is another barn stall nest uh, that we're actively monitoring this year. We're going to be putting out an aging pamphlet uh, based on this chick's growth. But what's really striking is uh, the one adult seems to be spending all of the time with the chicks, whereas the other adult comes in you have some nice pair bonding, allopreening going on here with the adults. You can see the two chicks in the background uh, preening themselves. But what's really exciting is, and, or surprising to me, is the bird that's outside the nest comes in and will actually feed its mate first. And for the first week, it didn't actually feed the chicks. The mate then went and fed the chicks uh, throughout the day. 
Uh, so that's something that was surprising. I was expecting both parents to maybe switch off um, and take their turns feeding from the get-go. Speaking of feeding, uh, unlike other raptors, vultures aren't going to carry anything in on their talons and then feed it out, so it's all regurgitated. Uh, so you can see here the adult uh, presents its bill to the chicks. The chicks are reaching down into the back of the throat. Uh, for the first two weeks, uh, these chicks are about two weeks old, um, it seemed to be mostly liquid based on the chick's behavior, but here you'll see uh, we're getting into chunkier food. So the adult actually grabs the chunk and you can see the chick tugging on it. So there's a development in uh, the chick's feeding mechanism. So strengthening those neck muscles, anything it drops, the adult is quick to uh, snap up. So we're getting some really cool insight into what's going on inside the vulture nest. And we're looking forward to getting these uh, nestlings tagged and following them throughout their life. Some of our tags have are still readable and on the bird 10 years after they were originally deployed. So this is a long-term data uh, collection tool that relies on you, the citizen scientist. And it's phenomenal because we don't have to catch the birds to re-encounter them. So we get people recording what the bird was doing. And like this black vulture, we are really excited about uh, our expansions and insights into vulture research throughout. We hope you all are just as excited as us, leap for joy. And whether you become a volunteer with uh, doing our road surveys uh, we're at 125,000 kilometers surveyed so far since we originally uh, started them, have uh, several thousand more uh, kilometers to go, or you want to do a monetary donation, we really appreciate you reaching out and asking to talk Vulture. Uh, and this is not a singular effort. We were the forefront of Vulture research uh, in the field but it is only through collaboration to conserve a species. You cannot go it alone. Uh, so you need the support and collaboration moving forward. So we look forward to having you join the roost. Now, if there's any questions, I believe David and I are happy to answer them. And I look forward to meeting you in the future, hopefully. Next year is not virtual. Wonderful. Bracken, thank you so much. That was fascinating. I love seeing that footage uh, of the vultures and the family, the babies and the nest. That was fantastic. And thank you so much, David and Lori, for your presentations as well. Really fascinating stuff. And we do have several questions, but before we get to questions, I just want to remind everyone that you can contribute uh, uh, and make a donation to support this really important vulture research that you just got glimpses into. Um, and I would just like to take a moment to share my screen and show you um, how you can make donations uh, to support this vulture research through our online auction. So give me a moment. Okay, so hopefully now everyone can see uh, the Hawk Mountain um, website homepage. So hawkmountain.org, you can just go to that and then it just pops up um, online auction. So let's click on that. So you can see, oh, uh, here we are at our Greater Giving online auction. And if you were to scroll down, there's so many fabulous items. Um, I don't know the exact number offhand, but I feel it's close to like 125 or 130 items, wonderful items, and some are really wonderful experiences. And if you're not sure how to sign up so you can bid, I, I can just show you. It's really, really simple. So, hey, you just click on Get Started. And then you would just click on Create an Account. And then you just fill out the information and they kind of self-guide you. It's really uh, self-explanatory. So, so we, we urge you to uh, support uh, this awesome research if, if, uh, if you would like to do so. So thank you so much. Okay, so we do have several questions that came in for our team. Okay, uh, Bracken, you were talking a lot about the wing tags and we do have a wing tag question. What does a yellow tag with PA28A on a black vulture tell you? Uh, that it's not one of our wing tags. <laughs> uh, we only put out uh, numbers uh, and I 
wonder if instead of a yellow tag, it might have been a light green. Uh, the USDA has a project and they put out a lot of light green tags that had two numbers and a letter out of Hershey. So that is valuable information. If you head over to the bird banding lab and report that uh, tag information, it will get to the uh, owner of the tag. Uh, so their sighting can go towards research. Awesome that you're seeing some tags. Okay, thank you so much. Another question, do black vultures outcompete the turkey vultures when they move into an area? I can answer that question. Um, if there is a large number of black vultures, they can outcompete turkey vultures at a carcass, um, but black uh, turkey vultures are slightly larger. So uh, at a carcass, you know, if there's a number of turkey vultures, if they outnumber black vultures, then um, they can they can rule that that carcass. But they don't necessarily push vultures out of the area when they arrive. All right, thank you so much. Um, and I believe we do have one more question. Um, and you touched on this a little bit, um, Bracken, with the video uh, at the nest, but just to uh, elaborate a little more with this question, does a pair stay at the nest site when they have young or does one go back to the roost? Uh, that's an excellent question. It all depends on a couple factors, how close the local communal roost is, uh, but typically we see from our video evidence anyway that it's one adult inside the nest area. Um, and then the other adult I've seen either in a nearby tree uh, or if there's a nearby roost, uh, sometimes I'll see a tagged bird move over in that direction. So we don't know a whole lot, but typically we're seeing one bird spending the night in the nest with the young. Wonderful, thank you. And more questions are coming in. This one is for David. David, do vultures leave on migration the same date each year? No, there's actually quite a bit of variation. Um, it most likely depends kind of a, on a daily basis when a bird decides to leave. Probably has a lot to do with environmental conditions on that day. If the conditions are right and it's around the right time that they would leave, then they might go. If the conditions aren't right, there's not a lot of thermals forming then they'll probably stay in that area until the conditions are right. So we've seen birds leave anywhere from a difference between one and two weeks, depending on the year. Wonderful, thank you so much. And I think that might be, I don't see any other questions coming in. So I just want to take this opportunity. Thank you again to our wonderful speakers, Lori, David and Bracken. Thank you so much for sharing your passion and your knowledge. And thank you to our wonderful, uh, guests in the audience who are joining us. Um, and here come, wait, wait, there's another question. Um, could range expansion be related to climate change? Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, vultures thermoregulate, um, but that bald head, uh, especially around here, uh, we historically didn't have vultures uh, necessarily through year round. Now we do. Um, but you see during those particular cold snaps, uh, they actually retract uh, how much skin's exposed. So feathers will go all the way up to the top of the head. But with some of these heavier snowstorms, they'll vacate our region and typically go south um, to a warmer area or move into a city uh, but warmer year-round temperature means the birds don't have to move out of an area. So absolutely, uh, it can impact range expansion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, let's see. Any other questions? That was a good one. Okay. So again, thank you, everyone. Thank you to our audience for supporting us. Um, I will be sending out an email as soon as, as we finish this webinar with all of the links, again, for you to click directly on that link to go to our online auction uh, to support this vulture resource or to make a bid for an item. Um, we'd like to close by again, thanking our very generous sponsors of our 2021 Benefit for the Birds Spring Campaign and Online Auction. We could not do this without your support. So again, we'd like to extend much gratitude 
to Allegra Lehigh Valley, PPNL Services Corporation, Christina Clayton and Stanley Culver, Jeff and Samina Weil, Deborah Edge and Neil Mann, Minturn Wright, Holly Merker, and everyone else who gave a donation to support, to support the 2021 spring campaign and benefit for the birds. Thank you so much for your generosity. And the vultures, thank you too. Thank you so much, everyone. And have a good evening. Bye. Thank you.